So you know why uh, you're here. You're here for the art of grad flicks. And um, whether we will snow you or show you today is also a matter of uh, opinion. Later on, let us know what you think. Um, I'm delighted to be here with Megan Fearhart, whom I've known for a number of years. We work together on, uh, on Three Minute Thesis. We worked together on Gradflix last year, and she worked uh, with me on a film that uh, I produced last year. So welcome to the, uh, welcome to the session. McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon, one palm agreement. Okay, uh, there's a common saying, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can cram every image and slide into a video or into a slide presentation doesn't mean you should do it. In fact, restraint is probably a good idea. However, why do American pharma TV ads snow you with fast talking narrators, distracting background music, notice we have no background music here, smiling humans, and we have at least one smiling human online right now, uh, fine print and low contrast print, what are they hiding? The answer to this question will be revealed at the end of this uh, session. Again, I'm delighted to be joined by Megan today, and hopefully you'll have a good experience. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Catherine Mabry and Judy Patterson of the School of Graduate Studies for facilitating GradFlix and making us feel welcome to be part of the, uh, part of the team. And there's also a number of acknowledgements of people that I've worked with recently, people whose material I've been using here and uh, you may see some familiar names. Um, uh, as I say, I'm always grateful for all the help and background uh, information that um, is possible. We have uh, three sort of official guests and maybe a couple of new unofficial guests. Um, uh, some of them will be joining us later. Nicholas Simard has already joined us. Um, he's an industrial PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering and COO of TBI Finder, an objective concussion assessment startup company. Welcome, Nick, there he is, his, um, his video is on. We'll be talking about his script uh, uh, very shortly. So he's probably waiting on tender hooks to hear what we might say. Erica Dow, uh, a PhD candidate in radiation sciences, Department of Physics and Astronomy, will be joining us later as well as Emily Wood, a musician and PhD student in uh, working in McMaster's Live Lab, where she researches interpersonal interactions during musical performances. So we expect a lively uh, discussion later on. So uh, let's show you something. Well, showing, uh, nothing better than taking a script and showing some opening lines and closing lines. You can find the video that I have in mind here on my YouTube channel. Michelle Ogrodnik, whom I've worked with many times in the past, has done three minute thesis and has, has been a winner in various other competitions. Sweat So You Don't Forget is the title of her, uh, of those presentations that she had. Notice the opening line. I'm Michelle Ogrodnik and I'm a mind wanderer. Come on, we've all been there. So she's immediately introducing herself and saying something that is relevant to everybody. And then in closing, she says, so one thing seems certain, students need to sweat so they don't forget. Thank you. And that one minute version she delivered in person during a workshop that I did a few years ago with her. Um, she graciously uh, uh, um, memorized it again for the second time and delivered it in person. So you can see the full thing there. Notice one thing, and you'll see this as we go through this workshop, the opening and closing could almost be part of a 20 second elevator pitch. What comes in between depends upon whether you have a one minute presentation, a three minute presentation or whatever, but the opening and closing 
uh, is something that seems to be almost uh, a, a constant. So what's our agenda today? We'll be looking at do's and don'ts of, in presentations and in videos. We'll be looking at the idea of story, titles, first impressions, particularly opening and closing lines, which we think is very important. We'll also talk about authenticity and ethics and citation, um, images, staging, audio, filming, editing. As I say, we can only touch very briefly on some of these subjects. And we will look at some Gradflix case studies, some videos and some scripts. And then we'll have uh, recollections and experiences as well as a Q&A. Now I've assembled these pictures here, which um, kind of tell you a little bit of a story. We all know who this person is. And uh, he's uh, with uh, Her Majesty the Queen in one of these images. Notice how he's dressed in different occasions. So he knows how to dress depending upon the occasion. And the other thing I want you to notice is notice that his right hand is relatively free to do whatever it wants to do. His left hand seems to be a little bit more occupied. Okay, that's a little bit of a clue to something that will come uh, up a little bit later on. Okay. And by the way, for those who might have just joined us, do unmute yourself, ask a question anytime, unmute, just jump right in, even if we're speaking. And uh, Megan will be looking at the chat area and uh, answering questions there. Yeah, feel free to leave questions in the chat as we go, or if you want to raise your hand um, and then uh, unmute, um, either one works. Uh, don't feel bad about interrupting. So, you know, it depends where you're presenting. Are you presenting in a physical classroom or auditorium? Are you online? Are you one-on-one -on -one in person? Perhaps an interview for a job? Again, one-on-one -on -one online. Again, perhaps an interview for a job. Are you presenting to a recording camera, looking into the camera as I am right now? Or to an off-camera interviewer? Or to an on-camera interviewer? Or is this a voiceover? There's so many different ways of doing this. And, you know, one size does not fit all. But there are still some common features that we'll try to bring out. Are they, that's the audience, that's your listener, the person, the people who are watching you, specialist in your narrow field, expert in the broader field? Are they academic? Are they industrial? Is it the general public? Is it your friend? Is it your family? Um, and what is your story, purpose, your core metaphor, your core image, your core message? What do you care about? What do you want them to care about? All of these things are factors that you need to keep in mind as you create this, your script and your video. A brief commercial. We pause for a brief commercial. The Caffeine Rabbit Hole, a film that uh, I directed and produced a year ago during the height of the pandemic in Ontario. You'll notice a few familiar names there. Emily Wood, I've already mentioned her. She did the music for this film. You'll also see another familiar name lower down. Megan Fearhout, who's online with me right now. And Rachel Ho, I'm not sure if Rachel will be joining us, but Rachel Ho um, helped design the promo image on the, uh, on the coffee cup. So there it is. Anyway, brief commercial. <clears throat> okay, let's go to a Gradflix case study. Anna Marinka, first place winners at the University of Waterloo last year. And uh, notice that she does a voiceover animation with on-screen text, frame-by-frame -frame drawings. And according to a, what I heard in a video that she delivered, she moved images from Adobe Illustrator to Adobe Premiere. And this is really, a, again, an outstanding uh, presentation. We can talk about it on the other side after we watch the video. Life is full of problems, and our capacity to face them is intimately tied to our mental health. So how do we do that? When we solve a problem, we draw from our past experiences and think of how we've overcome such obstacles before. These memories form our mental models, and we reference them to make predictions about the outcomes of our actions. Those predictions aren't always correct. When we experience errors, we update our mental models. Sometimes this process is hard. 
Sometimes we get help, and other times we're on our own. My research compares how input from different mediums affects mental model updating, specifically for self-help purposes. My experiments compare mental imagery, visual imagery, and visual spatial imagery, determining which one leads to the greatest improvement in self-efficacy, our belief that we can get over the wall. My goal is to improve mental health resources for everyone. Good, that was uh, great. I hope you all agree that was an amazing uh, presentation. And here's her script. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, 148 words. Life is full of problems and our capacity to face them is intimately tied to our mental health. Um, and let me again bookend this presentation. Life is full of problems and our capacity to face them is intimately tied to our mental health. So there, there is the middle part, and then my goal is to improve mental health resources for everyone. Uh, notice she, she opens up with mental health and problems, and she closes with mental health again on an improved basis. <clears throat> so I think this is a really very nice script. A lot of words, and uh, here's the opening and the closing. Megan, would you like to say a few things about this? We'll, we'll come back to it again later on in the, in the uh, presentation, but right now we have a, a few comments. Yeah, yeah. So um, just tacking on to what John mentioned a few times already is that, you know, whether you have a one minute video or you have 20 seconds to quickly tell somebody what your research is about, or you're delivering a three minute thesis on stage, or you're giving a 20 minute presentation as a seminar, uh, the story of your research has to be bookended. And um, the opening and closing lines are very significant for effectively telling this story. And what you kind of put in the middle of the sandwich depends more so on um, the setting that you're delivering it in, but the importance of the opening and closing line and hooking in your audience, as well as leaving them with a sense of satisfaction and understanding at the end um, is consistent uh, always. Um, and kind of just commenting a little bit on the video itself. So uh, Anna very effectively uses metaphor um, that you see uh, through her drawings. Um, she has a ladder and a wall and she's talking about, um, you know, problems that you may face and how you interpret them um, and how you process uh, coming to a solution. So, John, I don't know if you uh, want to talk more about the actual video itself and the images yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, uh, well, there's something, there's something about the image that you may not notice explicitly, but will we'll bring, will draw your attention to that a little bit later on. The, uh, the placement of the objects, the placement of the images in the frame, the, in other words, the composition, we'll, we'll, we'll be mentioning this, you know, over and over. Let me make my own personal remarks. Uh, from my own kind of personal point of view, the video feels almost just right. And I say almost for a, a certain uh, reason. It's relatable, it's substantive, the illustrations are meaningful, and the script makes complex content understandable. The text on the, uh, on, on, on the video makes it easy to study later. And I think the illustrations and script are all perfectly timed. And one of the things that, that jumped out at me is when I saw this for the first time, I did a double take. Oh my God, I have to see this again. It was probably the only video that I've seen in three, in, in grad flicks uh, in the last uh, two or three years that made me really want to go back and see that, see it again. <clears throat> Not because I didn't understand it, but more because I wanted to just, you know, get deeper and deeper into it. <clears throat> um, powerful imagery, it builds confidence, it's well articulated and the almost just right is uh, something that I, I indicate because I thought it was a bit fast, a little bit monotone. The speaker, of course, wasn't visible, but that isn't a, a big deal. The author, the speaker, never introduced herself. There was actually no title right on the, uh, on the video itself. So I, I just was a little bit uneasy. And also towards the end, I felt it was a bit rushed. <clears throat> I managed to take that script and reduce it from how many words was it? 148 
down to 125. And I don't think I lost any information there at all. And one of the things I want you to also see as we go through this is it is when you hear the words of the narrator or the speaker, and then you see the images, you could also say, I wonder how many words could be replaced by the images that are already there, that you don't need both the words and the images. <clears throat> okay, so let's know you a little bit. And by the way, again, do jump in, don't be shy, unmute, jump in if there's a burning question or something that, that struck you that we haven't touched on. Okay, story. Uh, we, we will emphasize the, the idea of using story to, to, to convey your research to a general audience. But what is story all about? I mean, look at these buzzwords, hook, show, tell, exposition, backstory, flashback, inciting incident, linear narrative, nonlinear narrative. I mean, you know, writing stories and filming stories is a multi-billion dollar industry. If you feel you don't get it or that it's kind of daunting, there's a, a reason for it. There's a, there are buzzwords even in writing stories. Um, Fr Freitag's uh, Pyramid, for example, which summarizes the essential aspects of story. The the introduction and the inciting incident that sets the story going, this dramatic problem that you have that sets the story going, the drama needs to rise, needs to reach some kind of a climax where there's a lot of action, and then the action kind of subsides. There's an explanation of what just happened, a resolution, and then everybody lives happily ever after, on, on, unless it's a tragedy, of course. <clears throat> tragedy that it's a disaster, but that's the same idea. But that's really, you know, that is a lot. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, if, if you don't get the idea of story, don't, don't, uh, don't um, panic. Gradflix was invented by the University of Waterloo in 2018 in terms of their general, uh, the general uh, framework and the rules, etc. Um, at McMaster University, uh, it's been on since 2021. It's a video competition where grad students have one minute to share their research, to win prizes, and be featured in McMaster's Grad Flix Showcase. So that's from the uh, um, School of Graduate Studies website. And there's, an, there's a really nice video by Elaine Westerhofer, um, that is accessible through the grad studies uh, website that I strongly advise you to watch. It deals with the actual nuts and bolts of making videos. It also touches a little bit on story and just looks at the overall picture. And there are resources available for you to go to. Now, as distinct from what they're doing at the University of Waterloo, where communication is 50% and creativity 30%, McMaster has decided to uh, make communication and creativity weight uh, 40% each. Um, that's the judging criteria. Anyway, what do we mean by communication? The idea of explaining complex ideas to a non-specialist audience. Um, creativity and visual impact, I think, are in a way self-explanatory. Technical quality includes, notice, citations and credits. And citations and credits are things that tend to be missing uh, from many w videos. And I think that they're really important. You, know, you, you, you always have enough time to give somebody credit, is my, is my, uh, my view. And John, just bouncing off of that, so McMaster actually made it mandatory this year that you must cite and credit every single um, asset that you're using in your video. So even if you're getting stock images um, or clip, out, clip art from uh, certain websites, um, even though uh, some of these websites and resources don't require citation legally, uh, McMaster is requiring that you just cite everything. I believe they've given an extra few seconds on the end of the time limit of the video to include that citation slide, um, just making sure that you're acknowledging everything that you're using in the video. Right. 
Yeah, so that's not included in the one minute. Okay. And then we have a question in the chat here. Should oh. you sell your own assets? Um, so uh, are you talking about, sorry, images that you're creating yourself or pieces of data? Uh, so you you technically can if you want. You can clarify where they're coming from. Um, uh, it's it if you took you took pictures. Uh, I would recommend yes because people may be wondering. Um, okay, where did that come from? Just for clarification, you know, although you're the one creating the video and you're the one that's actually providing your own pictures, of course you have uh, the rights and the permission to. But I would I would include it. Um, as yours in the citation slide, regardless, since you're already going to have that slide that lists everything, um, why not just clarify so people aren't left wondering where exactly did that come from? It can never hurt. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that they're including that explicitly. And, and that is also part of the rules at the University of Waterloo as well, by the way. Great, yes, moving on. So um, Megan, why don't you, of so course. We'll go with this. So John mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation today that just because you can doesn't mean that you should. So, you know, you're probably thinking about, OK, how do I explain my research? How do I create a video that matches my script and conveys my research visually? There are so many possibilities of things things you can do. You can have all the moving fancy odds and ends, um, but you must keep in mind that uh, you don't want to overwhelm and snow your audience. So just because something is an option um, that can be included in the video doesn't mean you should necessarily use it. Um, you don't want to make your video decorative. You want to include just what's required to tell the story since it's only in one minute and things are kind of going to be passing by quickly. So you don't want your audience to you know, be looking at something that you have in the corner of one of your frames that may not be all that relevant and then miss the big message. And uh, you know your script and your story very well. Um, you've been working on it. You have how you want to tell it in your mind. But the audience doesn't quite know yet. They're hearing it for the first time. So you must uh, make sure that you're not assuming that um, they may get it right away um, or that they may get it exactly the way that you're thinking about it. They only know what you tell them and what you show them. So you have to make sure that you're communicating that effectively and clearly, and in a way that's not too overwhelming for just a one minute video. And there's so many things that you can use, like I was mentioning, music, data, uh, images, jargon, just because you can, and just because you have all that stuff, doesn't mean you should put it all in because they can be very overpowering. Um, another thing is that, um, you have the option to include your own script or captions on the video. You can animate those in yourself and include them. It's up to you if you want to do that, but regardless of whether you do or not, it's also a requirement that you submit your transcript of your script with your video when you're submitting your GradFlix submission. And um, McMaster will be auto-generating captions and um, putting them underneath the video uh, if you don't choose to include um, the uh, script yourself on the video. And one last thing that I wanna mention here is your memorable core image. So later in the presentation today, we'll be showing you some examples of core images in different GradFlix videos. So what your core image is, is what frame of your video do you want the viewers to remember when they're thinking back to it after they've watched it? There's kind of like a central symbolic moment in the video that kind of sums everything up in just one frame. And uh, you want to keep this in mind um, when when you're creating your video. What when somebody thinks back to the story I just told, what do I want them to remember? What frame is the most important um, that will kind of jog their memory on my story? Okay, thank you. So keep going, Megan. Uh, so. Yep. Uh, so when you're creating your video and writing your script, you want to avoid being impersonal or generic. Um, you want to seem genuine. You want to really be telling your story and what you've been working on. And 
John and I were talking about this when we were preparing for this workshop. So a way that makes you as a speaker um, more memorable is to be visible either through video or some people even animate kind of like a little avatar of themselves as well as introduce yourself. So um, these aren't mandatory things that you have to include in your video. It's up to you whether you want to or not. Um, but kind of our personal opinion is it can be powerful to introduce yourself and say your name. So take a pause at one minute or at one moment in your script and say your name, say, I'm Megan Bierhout and I'm working on this and this. Um, and we just believe that that adds a little bit more personalization uh, and connects you more to your video. Uh, another thing is I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, how much is a video worth? Is it 2,000, 3,000? Keeping that in mind um, that um, of course, uh, you don't want to snow the viewers with all of the things that you can be including in the visual component. Um, and kind of what we uh, recommend on average is if you have a 60 second presentation or video, um, try not to go above around 130 to 150 real words um, because uh, you don't want to be overwhelming uh, the viewer with too many kind of things that you're talking about. You don't wanna be moving too quickly um, and you can take meaningful pauses. Uh, you can kind of let the pictures speak for themselves at certain points um, and going above 150 words can potentially get uh, a little bit overwhelming. Just a quick question. Yeah. Um, when you say real words, do you mean content words? No, no. Real, words in the script. No, I, I'm talking real words as this thing yeah. from image, Im words that are implied by an image, actual uh -huh. words. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry for the confusion there. No, it's all good. Thank you for your question. Yeah. So by real words, we mean words that you are actually saying as part of your script. Um, yeah. Great, okay, so moving on, um, there are some dangers and don'ts that uh, come to my mind already, and the idea of lack of story, um, and as Megan, I think, already implied uh, a, a number of times, um, images and animations could be irrelevant to your story, and of course, attention-splitting content that, that, that you want the audience to focus on this, but you're somehow providing them with something else that's splitting their attention. We've already talked about overlooked citations and credits. So this is all set for emphasis. And of course, fake graphs, you know, things that are things that are not scientifically based, but simply metaphorical graphs. I personally don't like that uh, very much. And of course, overwhelming people with data, snowing them, and actually, Megan, I, I kind of suggest 120 words. I think 130 to 150 is possible, but things start to heat up quite a bit. And of course, you, one of the biggest dangers is that you will rush too close to one minute. And if I can mention a little bit about Anna Marinka's presentation, if you go back and watch it again, you'll see it starts off very, very... Um, clear and going at the right pace, it kind of speeds up a little towards the end. And toward the, the very, very end of her presentation, things get quite complex, a little bit too complex to take in on the first, uh, on the first viewing. So you don't want to have that feeling of being rushed towards the end. So making your audience care and want more takes practice, awareness, and empathy for your audience. So let me snow you with a few um, phrases, buzzwords and phrases. Be clear, no jargon, no mind twisting logic, sentences short, punchy, words clean, crisp and clear. Always be yourself, be sincere, personal, don't act, don't pretend and kill that fake speech mode that we all tend to go into when we're delivering a speech. Um, Communicate your expertise, your citations, your commitment to the long haul, um, your own journey, your setbacks, which are often overlooked. What, what's your vision, your message? Communicate your humanity, your passion, and engage with their curiosity, knowledge base, needs, experiences, setbacks, desires, message, 
humanity and passion. So when you, when when these two things come together, then you have I think what I think is of as a perfect uh, presentation. Are we snowing you already with information? If we are, then that's you know what can I say? We'll come to some conclusion about that at the end where the snowing people works. So if you're still on the fence about Gradflex, Megan, tell them why they should uh, do Gradflex. So, you know, as a busy student, um, I'm sure you have a lot going on. Uh, of course, you have to be in a research-based program to participate in GradFlex. And I'm sure that you have your hands in many different baskets and you're thinking, okay, well, should I, should I divert my attention a little bit and participate and make a GradFlex video? So why, why should I? What are the benefits for me? So um, I personally say that there are many fruits to your labor. First of all, you have a tangible video that you have access to after that you created, and this is a way to showcase you. And uh, you can post a link to this on any of your social media platforms. I know academic Twitter is becoming quite common nowadays. Um, you can put it on YouTube. You can put a link on your CV, put it on your LinkedIn. The possibilities are really endless, and it, it kind of gives you that extra edge because you know, it's something that actually has you communicating your research. It's more than just a CV that is a document um, with written words. It, it definitely gives you that extra little bit um, that can make you more competitive for certain opportunities that arise later in life. I've heard a few stories where people have been like, oh, you know, um, I got hired at this job because somebody saw my three minute thesis recording on YouTube and they thought I was a great speaker um, and that helped get my foot in the door and things like that. So um, the possibilities and benefits that can come up in the future are really endless. And I'm sure you have all been asked at least a few times, so what's your research about? What do you research, whether that be your friends, your family, people at a conference, people that you meet in passing, um, you can provide them the link to your one minute video since you'll be explaining it in a way that uh, is understandable by a general audience. Um, and you know, it's a nice resource that you created. There's visuals that accompany it. Um, and your elevator pitch is going to be important at any stage in your career. You're gonna have to pitch yourself, sell yourself, um, and this is really a great exercise that prepares you for that, or it can even be used, like I just mentioned, um, as something that you share. And of course, the skills that you learn um, or that you polish up by creating a grad flex video are also endless. Communication, knowledge translation, technical skills. Um, to me, uh, I'm a huge advocate of just going with it and uh, participating in grad flex. And then I see we have a few ch questions in the chat that popped up here. So um, I've never done any animation. Do you have any resources for getting started? So um, there is actually a resource list uh, provided that you can find off of the McMaster GradFlex page. I believe Elaine uh, Westenhofer from the Lions New Media Center put this together. So I see another comment in the chat, um, yes, the Lions New Media Center did provide um, a list. And uh, yeah, have, have a look and um, kind of start there. They also talk about different softwares that McMaster has access to. There are also a lot of free softwares or softwares that you can get free trials for. And um, I also want to add on that you don't have to be an expert in, in animation or in any of these softwares to uh, produce a high quality video. Um, so uh, don't don't be too nervous about that. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Megan. And then again, briefly, to give us. Uh, you've already covered some of this already, but just run through this very briefly. So if you do choose to uh, have a filmed video um, where you're actually, you know, filming yourself or filming different things about your research, um, or you're doing a hybrid where you have some animation and some filming, there are things that uh, you want to consider because, um, you know, it may seem easy and quick, but there are a lot of things that can happen. So um, first of all, you want to experiment. Uh, you want to give yourself a lot of time to kind of see how you want to set the frames. Um, where do you want to place your camera? Where do you want to be facing? What's the lighting going to look like? And plan this 
out. Um, for example, when I was creating my video, I actually took some tape and marked some spots on the ground. And uh, I was like, I'm going to stand here every time for every take that I film and I'm going to face this way and the lighting has to look like this. Um, because what we also recommend is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to kind of film just one 60 second take and have it be exactly what you want and that's what you move forward with. So you wanna probably take multiple takes and at uh, in the editing stage, you want to pick um, the best kind of clips that, uh, you know, that look the best where there weren't distractions, um, such as the audio being distorted or sounds in the background. Um, so yeah, you want to film multiple takes uh, with consistent lighting and audio and setting and kind of stitch them all together. Um, another thing, I remember John recommended this to me because when I was creating my video, I was like, oh, you know, I'll just put the camera on like a box or something, some type of stable surface. And John recommended, you know, you really should use a tripod. Uh, it just makes everything better. It makes sure that everything's stable. You're going to have the same height um, that the camera set at every time. So using a tripod for sure, and uh, using some type of equipment that makes your auto audio quality high, um, whether that be a microphone. Um, I find that um, some headphones, such as I use my um, Apple AirPods, uh, had very high audio quality as well. So you want to experiment with these things and just make sure that things that have to do with quality aren't getting in the way of um, the way that you tell your research. Good. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's go through a few more case studies. We have a couple more to get through. Nick Simard is probably waiting uh, breathlessly to hear what we might say. Um, and uh, he was the people's choice for Gradflix uh, 2021 at McMaster University. And there's the title of his presentation, um, 123 words, which I thought was really good. And if you go and watch that video, um, you'll find that he speaks in a very relaxed voice that actually um, uh, is confidence inducing. He sounds authoritative and he's, isn't rushing through his words. So he doesn't, you don't feel that he's trying to snow you at all. Um, I don't like the title, but the title is not a very catchy title. So I think there may be, a, uh, I mean, it's an appropriate title. Um, but maybe not the catchiest one. But one thing that's really interesting to me is his opening and closing. He starts off with concussion. Many of us have had one before and you're about to see one now incoming. So if I haven't whetted your appetite to go and see this video, I don't know what else. I mean, to me, this is like a, a trailer for his uh, one minute video. He does introduce himself, notice that, which I think is important. And then towards the end, this delivers game-changing information on the presence, severity, and location of injury, finally providing patients and clinicians clarity on concussion. So he starts with concussion, he ends with concussion. It's well bookended. And again, 123 words. So Nick, if you want to unmute, just say a couple of words, to say hello. Right, well, again, Thanks for the opportunity to, to kind of present here today. <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right. The title needs to some rework to make it a lot more catchy. Um, but a lot of the things we can kind of bring up in the Q&A section later. Yeah. Um, uh, just a, a few things that I, I would like to, to, to talk about when crafting the script. One of the first things is like your script is an iterative process. And I think this is maybe the, the, the 20th edition of something like this that I've made. And so, it, it, it's always fluid. It's always changing. It can always be reworked kind of thing. Um, and again, like I said, it's an absolutely iterative process. Uh, I think too, it's very important to note is the, the book ending uh, because what it also provides is like a full circle story of what you're trying to say. And it also gives this sense to the audience, uh, like an aha moment to be like, oh, that's what we were talking about the whole time. And, and, and like, like we had mentioned, it, it bookends it really nicely. Um, yeah. and, and one of the things too, is like your, your literature skills can come in handy in the end here. Uh, maybe I'm a little biased, but like one of the things that I, that I like inputting in the script at the end is like the, the alliteration, clinicians, clarity on concussions kind of thing. Use, use some of these like 
English tools that you've learned about, you know, years ago, they can kind of help you create a, a, an interesting and fun script that's that's sometimes nice to hear. So uh, yeah, in fact, I would even shorten that ending a little bit. This delivers game changing information on game changing information finally providing clinicians that would have been even more rhythmical i know i know that you would want to include that but it's even more rhythmical if you remove on the presence of etc because you've sort of covered that in a way already in the middle <laughs> anyway well, there's lots more in the q a believe me we'll have lots of time to talk more about this so thanks uh, thanks nick for coming on Great. The next uh, uh, video, will, uh, this video that we'll see is by Erica Dow, second place winner from last year. Um, so let me play that video. And uh, again, notice a few things here. Notice the composition. Notice the composition and notice how she introduces herself. Figuring out the exact size of a cancerous tumor is a tough task. With imaging technology, we have a pretty good idea of the size of the tumor, but it could change by the time a patient is lying on the operating table. Surgeons will try their best, but there's a risk they won't get all of the cancer. How can we help them know exactly how much tissue to remove? My name is Erica Dow, and I'm developing a tool to detect the margins surrounding breast tumors during surgery. Breast tissue contains structural and metabolic compounds. If we shine light on the tissue, these compounds reflect and emit light of a certain intensity, wavelength, and lifetime. When we measure these properties, we look for trends that can be used to develop an algorithm that can tell if an unknown sample is cancerous or non-cancerous. This handheld device will give surgeons the peace of mind of knowing that their patients are completely cancer-free. Yeah, I, I thought that was a really, really uh, spectacular video. Uh, again, I will come back to this idea of composition and core image. What, what kind of remains with you later on? We'll analyze that uh, very shortly. Now, it's 164 words. That's, that's a lot of words. That, to me, is at the upper limit of number of words. And yet it didn't sound overly rushed. She does introduce herself. Figuring out the exact size of a cancerous tumor is a tough task. This handheld device will give uh, surgeons the peace of mind, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the book ending idea, the opening and closing lines, there they are again, opening and closing lines. Megan, you want to say a few words about her opening and closing lines at all? Yeah, so um, again, this is a wonderful example of book ending. So Erica opens up with, uh, the problem and something that we can all understand. Um, and then in the end, uh, she closes with her solution to the problem and um, exactly what her research is focusing on doing and how it is looping back to uh, solving that problem at the beginning. So I think this is a wonderful example of uh, coming full circle and giving the viewer the satisfaction at the end of the video. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Megan. So again, I, I, I revised this from uh, 164 down to 132. And again, um, I don't think I lost any information. So this is an alternative script that I, uh, I put together. Another Gradflix case study, Rachel Finnerty. Well, we won't be watching her video, but we'll look at her script, uh, Music Therapy and Proactive Wellness. 102 words, uh, that is really at the low end, which is great. It allows her to be much more relaxed and engaging. And if you look at the title, Music Therapy and Proactive Wellness, you really don't want this thing to be frenetic or rushed. So I think that certainly goes well with the title. Um, Again, notice engaging undergraduate university students in proactive mental health is critical. Negative stigma can be a barrier to reaching out for help. So that's her opening line. Let's bring proactive wellness to campus. So she starts off with a problem and provides the solution. So I, th I, I think it's a nice, uh, it's a good script and well worth watching. Uh, and she came third in that particular competition last year. Emily Wood, who should be joining us if she isn't already here, a finalist from last year, and she's one of the people that was working with me on my film. Um, she opens with, 
isn't it amazing how musicians play together, etc.? She closes with, my goal is to understand how musicians communicate, to coordinate, to create the music we love. So I say that ahead of time to get you to listen to that. And uh, let's uh, see you at the other end of this. Isn't it amazing how musicians play together all at the same time, all without a single word? Next time, look closely. They communicate with movements, body sway movements. In McMaster's Live Lab, we study the body sway of groups with motion capture. We create 3D models of musicians while they play, and mathematical modeling reveals how they influence each other. We basically measure nonverbal communication through body sway. I aim to answer questions like, how do ensembles use body sway to learn unfamiliar music together? And how do body sway interactions develop in children? My goal is to understand how musicians communicate to coordinate to create the music we love. That's great. Um, again, notice that she introduces herself on the video, but not necessarily in, in words, um, verbally. Again, there are, are opening and closing lines. And um, we, should, we can ask Emily when she arrives uh, uh, um, a little bit more about that. So we'll move on for the moment, unless Megan has a burning uh, comment to me. So Emily's actually on the call now. Oh, I don't know if you want to come back during the Q&A or... Okay, no, no, if she's there, that's great. Well, there you are, Emily. Good. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Emily. So listen, we'll, we'll obviously do more in the Q&A, but is there anything you want to add? I'm not sure when you came on, but we've been talking about bookending uh, presentations with opening and closing lines. We've also talked about framing and, and positioning of characters within, within the frame. Uh, and we're working on that. I'm not sure when you came in, but do, do say a few words. Yeah, sure. So when I first heard about the grad six competition, I kind of had like a vision in my mind and it was, it was that frame with the motion capture actually. So the, the video of the musicians playing and then the overlay of the motion capture markers over top of that and then going to those um, point light figures I showed there. So that's kind of like the first kind of idea I had when I heard about the grad six competition. So I kind of started with that and I built my video out, out from that scene. So that was kind of what I viewed as kind of the, the pinnacle of my video. Um, so, you know, I, I worked with that, those images, and then I kind of built my script kind of around those images. So I, I kind of worked from the middle outwards um, from there. And that kind of allowed me to really um, look at the broader picture, I guess, when I was, um, making my video so that kind of allowed me to really connect the beginning and the end together in that bookended manner that um, uh, you have been talking about and John and I talked about that quite a bit when we were working on my script so um so so yeah I, I had that in mind when I was working on it and that's what I was trying to portray with the, this opening and kind of ending line here to make it the kind of a whole story together. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And I, I'm glad you mentioned this idea of sort of a, an image. In a sense, I think you, you, you indicated a core image, some kind of an image that you had in your mind and you worked around that image, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, we'll come, to, there'll be more, more, more discussion on that very shortly. Um, let's come to Megan's uh, presentation. Um, again, she was a finalist last year. Here are her opening lines and closing lines. We'll see them again at the other on the other side of the video, and 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 Megan can say a few words about them. Then, is there anything you want to say before we begin your video, Megan? No, please, please begin. Okay. Imagine your lungs are like an elastic band; they stretch and recoil as you breathe in and out. Now, imagine your lungs are stiff, like a thick elastic band you just can't stretch. 
If you live with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, this may be your reality. I'm Megan Vierhout. My research explores possible causes for IPF. I study a blood cell called the monocyte, which, we believe, enters and leads to thickening of the lung tissue. I compare monocytes from IPF patients to monocytes from healthy people and aim to uncover differences in their properties. My hope is that someday, when we better understand these monocyte cells, we can cure IPF, this terrible disease that robs us of something so simple as breathing. So there it is, uh, 124 words. Notice one thing, by the way, that she not only introduced herself, but her, her name came up on the screen as well. So, uh, Megan, would you like to say a few words about this? Yeah, so um, I, I created my video uh, with starting with the script. And uh, then I didn't even know if I wanted to film. I didn't know if I wanted to animate. But my plan was start with the script, um, tell your story through words. Um, since um, I, I uh, competed in three minute thesis a few years back and then um, prepared to compete in three minute thesis again in 2020, which was unfortunately canceled uh, just a few days before due to the pandemic. But um, kind of my experience stemmed from writing your script because in three minute thesis, you just have one static slide and yourself to tell the story. So um, yeah, that was kind of my ground zero. Um, and then from there, I created a storyboard and uh, planned out exactly what I wanted to do and how I wanted it to look from the words themselves. Um, and I, of course, incorporated uh, introducing myself um, to kind of, you know, connect myself a little more to my research and my story. Um, I tried to bookend. Uh, I don't think I bookended as well as I could have here. Um, basically, the approach I took was uh, starting with a metaphor that um, uh, people would understand. So, you know, I say that I study a lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that's kind of a mouthful of words. So I tried to create a metaphor for it that would um, help the viewer understand uh, what I was getting at. Um, and then at the end, um, I talked about uh, kind of the solution to the problem that uh, my research is addressing. Um, and yeah, that's it really. Okay, great. Well, we'll come back to more of this in the discussion. Again, there you are, the, her opening and closing lines. So we're near, nearing, nearing the end of the formal presentation and then we'll open up to a general Q&A. And I know that there's other um, uh, people online that, that can help us with with their own uh, uh, comp competitive uh, stories. First impressions. So this is about three minute thesis, but what is a three minute thesis picture doing in a grad flex uh, presentation? Well, um, all kinds of things. Uh, if you're going to show yourself uh, as a person, then dress tends to be important. Notice that he's wearing a white shirt with sleeves rolled up. That gives you a message. He's wearing a tie, which is predominantly blue. Interestingly, the logos behind him are predominantly blue. That sort of is a very nice composition. And his slide, if you actually go and watch his three-minute thesis presentation, his slide features a blueberry as the, as, as, as the point of focus. What color is a blueberry? Blue. So this kind of framing and color coordination and, uh, and choice of what you wear and, and, and so on can also be really quite important. So first impressions are important. Let's come to core images. And I want you to notice a few key things which we've sort of touched upon. We've teased you a little bit. Now, these are, these are my selections of core images, Anna Marinka's core image. Notice that the protagonist, who is presumably Anna herself, uh, is standing stage right. She's on the left side of the screen. She's stage right. And her thought process indicates the ideal situation, the ladder that she expects to be able to use to surmount the wall. Notice that the ladder in, that she's facing is too short. That's her problem. Her predictions aren't correct. But that's what I think is the core image, sort of the idea that you're 
left with at the end. Now, we don't have time to talk about Sitara's uh, video presentation because of time, but I do invite you to go and watch this video. It's a really, really good video. Um, University of Ottawa, uh, uh, GradFlix competition. Um, do watch this. This is a really good uh, presentation. But notice that she is, again, stage right. That means she's on the left side of the screen and using her left hand or left arm to, to, to point. Emily's uh, Woods core image, in my estimation, is this. Of course, there are other choices, and these are all very personal choices. Notice that she's also sitting, you know, stage right, which means on the left-hand side of the screen. And that's the, that is the power position in that particular composition, stage right, in my, in my kind of uh, opinion. So she needs that in order to be the person that who is really in authority over this particular uh, grouping. And again, Emily, you can jump in on that if you feel I have uh, mischaracterized your core image. No, I, I was thinking of the same image as well um, as my core image. In fact, oh. I'm kind of thinking back on my GradFlix video and I realize now that the sequence goes by so fast. I almost wish I spent more time with these images in, in my videos. Yeah. No, it's good. No, it's a, I, I think it's great. Everything seemed to work very well. Look how well composed this is as well. Everything is well, well framed and well composed. Megan's core image, in my estimation, uh, again, notice that she is stage right. She's on the left side of the screen. And again, to me, that indicates a, a sort of an authoritative uh, position. Uh, Megan, of course, you can jump in and say uh, anything there that you feel uh, you know you'd like to add i i agree um and um in terms of that being my core image i agree as well because uh that is the metaphor that i was introducing with to try to get the audience to understand um what exactly this disease comprises and what has to be solved in it so um, stiff lungs that are kind of hard to to they don't have very good elastic properties and makes breathing difficult. So I agree. <laughs> Great. Th th thanks, Megan. And again, Erica Dow's core image. Notice that, uh, that the avatar er Erica is using for herself is again stage right. Um, the surgeon, it looks like uh, she is in stage, uh, in, well, center stage. And um, stage left is the device or the tool. So the idea is that the researcher is exercising control over the surgeon, exercising control over the, the tool. And notice that this tool is much smaller in size than, 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 the other, than the other people. So this also gives the impression that this tool is not really overpowering in any particular way. Um, so I don't know if Erica is online um, yet. Erica is here. Oh, good. Hi, Erica. So this is your core image. I don't know how much you've been listening to so far, but what do you think about this notion of a core image? Yeah, I think um, for my video, since I didn't have any video of what I actually looked like, I thought it'd be really important to have me still in the video some way like having an avatar so that the audience still feels like they really connect to you and your video so i think john had lots of great comments about placement um and how that ties into the different relationships of the characters inside of your video yeah great thanks thanks erica and rachel affinity she's online too and again it's a little harder for me to choose that core image but um again the Weak, the person who is in a vulnerable or weak situation is um, stage left. Um, so the protagonist, if the protagonist were displayed, who's sort of helping perhaps or is in control or in charge would be, could be stage right. But uh, Rachel, if you're there, can you? Uh, Rachel actually had to leave at 1 p.m. Oh. Um, there's a message in the chat. Okay. Um, so. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Well, I'll catch up with her later on on that one. And Nick, Nick, who is here, Nick, I uh, chose this as the core image for your presentation. Again, uh, the alarmed protagonist is um, stage right. Uh, hopefully in control at some point of the situation. Maybe Nick is gone. Oh, he's there. Okay. No, I'm here. Yeah, th th this one's a bit uh, kind of difficult to, 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 to identify like one core image, but uh, generally I, I put the clinician on the, the stage right side. Sometimes he's happy, sometimes he's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> Nothing wrong. The hero, the hero can be mighty unhappy while the while the action is going. Right. Yeah. So so there it is. That's great. Okay. So coming to catch uh, to titles, um, and I'm going to stick for the moment to three minute thesis titles, uh, which are also applicable to grad flicks. Uh, look at these titles. Uh, where does cancer begin? We've already seen this in a way from Erica. Fighting obesity with fat, sniffing out weapons with microwaves. Are we drinking pharmaceuticals? I mean, to me, these are also kind of shorter, punchier, and somehow catchier. And I think you should definitely consider uh, something like this when you're um, developing your opening and closing lines and your core image and so on. So closing lines. So the riddle at the beginning, why do uh, American pharma TV ads snow you with fast talking narrators, distracting background music, smiling humans, fine print and low contrast print, which we haven't been really recommending. I don't think we've recommended a lot of this uh, here. Well, why do they do that? Because it works. So the bottom line, sadly, I have to say, sometimes knowing the audience does get you what you want, which may not be the right thing or the right way to do it, but it does seem to work. Anyway, do reach out to me. I'm happy to help anyone involved in Gradflix with their script and or video. Uh, just, just simply reach out to me. And we're finished with the formal presentation. So I will stop sharing slides and uh, open up the floor. Um, please uh, unmute yourselves, um, turn on your video if you want to be seen, but just ask questions. Uh, I noticed that Valentina Palazzi is on. She's in Perugia, Italy. Um, we recently, hi. hi, Valentina. Why don't you, if you're vis if you're able to be visible, let's see you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Valentina is a veteran, veteran a microwave engineer, uh, um, yeah. postdoctoral fellow right now in Perugia, and uh, she did a three-minute thesis twice: once in 2019, once in 2021. Um, she was uh, the MC's choice in 2019 and placed second in 2021 for Three Minute Thesis. She also made a video very recently, and we talked about her video. So, Valentina, why don't you say a few words uh, to open up the discussion? Yeah, I, what I can say is that, yeah, for me, you know, taking part in, in this project was useful, you know, for all the reasons that we said uh, so far, you know, about... Um, yeah, going, you know, highlighting what is really important and what really, you know, matters, you know, identify the message that we want to deliver to people. This is, this is a fantastic. This is something that, you know, at least in my life before, you know, during my studies, it was never highlighted. It was never, you know, um, let's say, um, it was not something that I was thinking about when, uh, you know, I had to prepare a speech. So it was very useful. But second, second, you know, the second aspect is that I'm not an native speaker, as you can see. And so it was also very important um, to, you know, see how I should uh, speak in a different language, which kind of rhythm should I, you know, I had to take, I, I had to keep. And um, yeah, it was, it was very, it was very important. It was a, um, a moment of confrontation with other people 
that were in uh, the three minute thesis competition that were you know attending the coach uh, lessons so it was very very important uh, for all these aspects yeah. <clears throat> Valentina just wrote an article on three minute thesis but it's really in a way equally applicable to uh, video production um, the idea of communicating your research to a general audience and all the issues that you have to um, have to take into account. Um, so, uh, Emily, Erica, Nick, um, any thing you want to add? Uh, any words of advice? Uh, anything that you've heard so far that you agree with, disagree with? Again, you know, this is very much a personal uh, um, kind of uh, personal opinions that Megan and I are giving here. Some of, the, some of them may or may not be founded on hardcore fact. So. I just wanted to add, add something with regards to, to crafting your presentation. Um, one of the things that I found to be very successful and, and stick with some audience, audiences is sticking with a particular, particular theme and or storyline. So I'll, I'll give one example too. And uh, we also have someone else uh, here with us, Calvin Ju, who is the inaugural Glad Grad Flicks winner. Right. I might you be know, a little. Uh, I noticed him, I noticed him uh, coming on. Yeah, you know, Calvin, by all means, uh, mm -hmm. join the group. He was the winner last year at 2021 Grad Flicks at uh, McMaster. He's, and he's also an engineer. So, so. And I might be a little biased because uh, we're in the same research lab, <laughs> but, but the one thing I kind of wanted to bring up, especially with his presentation, something that I found so memorable is that, uh, you know, I had some friends and family that, that watched the entire showcase and uh, my, uh, my fiance's dad actually watched it and said, you know, what presentation I loved was that duck guy. And so Calvin's presentation was all centered around how he was an expert in duck images and then related that to MRI images, what his research was actually about. But it was very interesting that he, he kind of picked this theme and everyone was able to relate to it by saying, oh, that's the duck guy. And then similar to something that was brought up earlier, uh, Michelle Ogrodnik, um, um, in her presentation, Sweat So You Don't Forget, a lot of people kind of remembered that tagline and then she goes into it and then she comes back to it and then you always remember, oh, that's the, that's the sweat, don't forget girl kind of thing. So. I always like to think if you have that underlying theme that can wrap everything together, it really makes it powerful to connect with your audience members and makes you memorable, basically. And so uh, I'd love to love to hear kind of Calvin's thoughts on all that. But yeah, yeah. Calvin, if you want to say a few words, please do. Yeah. Uh, sure. So the funny thing about the duck example is that like it, it, it just ended up being such a great example, like without me intending to it intending to have it like that so like, the funny story behind like the duck and like all that is um the, the, the a duck is my favorite animal so it was just something that i just picked out of thin air just to say everyone knows what a duck is we're going to start talking about ducks because i like ducks and then it just so happened to fit with that old adage you know if it walks like a duck or talks like a duck it's a duck but it's not actually a duck in like all the analogies that i'm pulling with it so it just kind of like fell into place for anything so but I do agree that like it is good to have something that uh, everyone can kind of relate to in one way or another and kind of like, you know, piece your narrative from there. No, it's a great image. Actually, it's really well worth watching. And remember, it's only a one minute video, so I do recommend it. By the way, Calvin, I can cut I can cut 30 words off your script um, with, with it's 169 words, which is really at the high end. So uh, if I actually didn't script it at all. You didn't script it at all. Wow. That's why I don't have a transcript to give. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's well, that's good. You know, but again, remember when you so you were improvising then. Is that what you're saying? Mostly, yes. Yeah, no, that's an incredible improvisation. But remember the big danger with improvisation is going on for too long. And that's always a danger that we think with we're only you're allowed 30 seconds, one minute or whatever, and you kind of improvise. You, there's this tendency to go on for long, but that's interesting that you should say that. Well, the, the way that I approached it wasn't that like, I'm going to improvise for exactly one minute. It is, I'm going to tell my story and then I'm going to end on my punchline, but I'm going to make sure that I get everything out. And then from there, I can take out the parts that don't build to that punchline and I have about a minute left. 
Interesting, interesting. Well, I really like this uh, other dimension to the stories uh, we're telling. Um, and Erica, you also had a lot of words. Um, is there, as I say, how do you feel about the number of words? I think it was 164 words in your case. Yeah, I think, um, you know, retrospectively, you can always think of ways to improve your script, but I was pretty happy with um, the delivery of it. Yeah. So I think yeah. one advice I would always give to people is, to take everyone else's advice with a huge grain of salt and really think about how your own personal strengths and weaknesses tie into the video making process. So for example, um, for me, I found that my strength was in the verbal delivery and my weakness was in uh, everything else related to video production. So for me, um, I knew that I could rely on possibly having to speak a little bit faster to squeeze in all of the content instead of having to like video edit and like clip audio and clip visuals and all of the video production side. So for me, um, in the video making process, I just similar to Calvin talked until I had one minute and then I built my video around the one minute that I had developed. And I thought that the, the pacing was fine for the one minute, so I didn't need to like edit or anything. So um, I think that's something that we both had in common. Yeah. That's, 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 that's very tough. I, as I say, I, I would only recommend that for extremely articulate, uh, very, very kind of focused people. I, I, I couldn't do that. If you asked me to talk for a minute on something, I would be still talking after five minutes. So, so. so if I can... But in really quickly about that one more time, because like if I remember Erica's video was the one and that was also a little animation, right? So and it goes with that, that question earlier about um, if you're a beginner animation. So that this kind of style just kind of naturally lends itself to the way you build like an animation as video, right? So especially if you're going to try to do lip syncing, which I, I did a little bit of, which wasn't great. But it, anyways, so the idea is that you can have your voice lines first and then you can craft whatever scene or whatever you're trying to depict after based on that from one like drawing to the next because you have to manually create all of your drawings for the most part frame by frame and so you kind of have a little bit of an easier time fitting pictures and images to uh improvised script in this way yeah that's exactly what i did was i had the script and then um i actually made all of my art in powerpoint so nothing fancy um, and then I made all of that in tune with the audio that I already had. Um, at the end, I actually did think about trimming down my script so it was shorter. So after I'd made the video, I actually re-recorded another version of the audio. And then I actually found that trying to edit the video to match the new audio was way too hard. So I just completely scratched that idea because I knew that was my weakness was the video editing component. Oh. But um, so, Erica, as I as I recall, you did that in a quite a bit of a hurry, right? Last year, you were in a, you didn't have enough time. But if if you gave yourself enough time, or if one does give oneself enough time, I think the idea of writing a script um, that may or may not be too long, uh, doing all the images, and then and then and then seeing what that stream of images looks like, that might that could affect the way you rewrite the script. Because if you have if you have images, pictures in your frame that that already tell the story, why duplicate it with with words? So the idea of creating all those images and then maybe going back to the script is is a, is possible if you have enough time to do it. Yeah, it could be possible, but it really depends on I think the format of the video. Like I think Calvin's example yeah. of if you wanted to have the animation matching the voice, that would be impossible oh, to yeah, do yeah, sure. yeah, the true. other way around. So sure, sure. I think really look at where your strengths lie and what you think would be possible with your skill set. Like I wouldn't be able to have the video syncing with the audio like Calvin did way too hard um, and then make the best of what your strengths bring to the table. Yeah, I know. But both Calvin and Eric are just absolutely outstanding uh, videos. Really amazing. Quite very impressive. Um, Emily, and what, sorry. Oh, 
I wanted to add something that, yeah, I didn't say before, also because, um, yeah, I don't know if this is the case, because I saw all your presentation, all, you know, you know during this uh, workshop today, and uh, that seemed very, you know, important and very, you know, um, it's a, you, you are doing something great. And uh, I, 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 met, I remember that when I started um, preparing the three-minute tests, uh, this was my main uh, uh, weak point, I thought, because uh, I'm an electrical engineer. And uh, at that time, I had made a speech on the uh, paper that I submitted to this uh, conference. And it was about uh, 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 butter matrix for reconfigurable antennas. And so making this kind of subject uh, relevant to uh, non-technical audience, uh, I thought it was quite... Uh, you know, not, not that much important topic. And, but what I, you know, what I've learned is that basically, you know, if you think that if you get from your work, the most relevant parts, uh, everything can seem relevant. Uh, or at least, you know, of course, if you are talking about uh, maybe medicine, this is clear to everyone. But anyway, I think that this is one of the best, the most important thing that I've learned that uh, basically you can, you know, whatever is the topic you're talking about, you can, you know, transform it and make it relevant for, for your audience. Just, you know, uh, looking at the aspects that are, um, you know, that are really impacting, that are, you know, that are making an impression of the, on the life of people. I think this is one of the, of the best uh, things that I've learned. Uh, during this process, and I wanted to uh, share. Why, why didn't you comment? People can comment on um, this idea of having a medical or biomedical problem that somehow makes it easier to connect with an audience. You know, everyone here, whether it's Emily, Megan, uh, Nick, Calvin, Erica, and, and Rachel, who had to leave us, these are all kind of medical or biomedical types of problems that are being addressed. It somehow they somehow lend themselves more easily to being communicated. You you want to comment on that? Anyone want to comment? Because there's always people in engineering, for example, that come to me and say, you know, my work is so abstract, it's so mathematical, I couldn't possibly explain it to anyone. And of course, that's what Valentina is talking about. Um, I'll jump in. So sure. uh, I think it it's kind of really easy to assume or think that somebody working on something biomedical or medical is at a bit of an advantage because uh, it, it kind of seems like, you know, people would understand that easier. Okay. Uh, the point of your research is to improve human health, which we can all appreciate uh, and we all think is important. But um, however, I, I think that's kind of a bit of a stigma and everybody's research um, is important. Everybody's research has an impact. And that's the reason why you're doing it. And like Valentina mentioned, it's, it's about um, thinking about exactly how you want to communicate it. So that importance comes across. So the impact comes across. And um, I guess people kind of, especially engineers kind of get stuck behind that stigma. And they're like, Oh, it's, it's such a technical thing that I'm working on. But in, in the end, down the line, it still has an impact um, on you know, life as we know it and a positive impact. So, um, you know, don't don't shy away from communicating your research and partaking in these knowledge translation activities um, where you can uh, really talk about that impact. And although, you know, improving human health is something that everybody understands and it's easy to understand, it doesn't mean that uh, work in engineering isn't just as important. By the way, I noticed that Rachel Ho is online. Rachel, if you want to join us, uh, she's also a bit of a veteran in this area. Um, Hi, John. I was just typing in a message into the group chat. I'm trying to, I don't have my camera set up, but I can try to get that going. Okay. I was just going to say that I've attended so many engineering 3MTs and um, coming from a science background, I think I've also been very exposed to more health related research and even like Nicholas, who's in, who's in the engineering side of things, is related to health. And I understand why there there's that bit of a fear of 
their material not being accepted by the general population. But having seen so many engineering speeches so far, or 3MT speeches that are similar to the three uh, to the grad flex videos, I've been really impressed with how all those speakers have been able to translate their work into a, for a lay audience. That's good. And by the way, Rachel, Rachel designed this uh, logo here, for <laughs> the film that we did uh, a year ago. And again, there's a there's a sort of a psychological neuroscience aspect to this uh, thing as well. We can talk about that, Nick. I see Nick uh, nodding his head there. Let Let's talk about this. <laughs> I, I was just going to add uh, actually something to the to the entire discussion here where um, I completely agree with Megan in that there's like a certain stigma in the sense that, oh, you know, like, uh, for example, my background in undergrad was electrical engineering. And a lot of people in electrical engineering say, oh, my topic is so abstract. I don't know, like how to effectively communicate it. I think it's all about just finding the parallels for a lay audience to understand, um, like Rachel had uh, alluded to. And the common example is like, uh, how would you explain your research to your mom or your grandma? I kind of like to take a step back and saying, no, how would you explain it to uh, like an elementary school student? How would you get them interested in your topic? And how would you break it down and find parallels so that they'd understand? Uh, like a very small knowledge base, but it helps you draw parallels and saying, you know, like uh, the work that I do on an electric car, well, you can actually compare it to, you know, a toy car or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it, it draws those parallels to make sure that even if it's a very technical topic, you can break it down into fundamental levels so that anyone can understand. Yeah, uh, Geneva Smith had a question there or a comment in the chat area. Megan, you want to address that? Or? Yes. So it says, I think there's also an assumption that most research is not valued as much as health is. Um. So I think that kind of falls into the stigma that I was talking about. And um, yes, of course, human health is extremely important. Um, but when it comes to the impact of health-based research um, and research in other areas as well, um, that impact is just as important. And um, uh, like Nick was mentioning, you can draw parallels um, in the way that you explain it, that really communicates um, that importance as well. And uh, I know because of that stigma, things can sometimes be intimidating. Like, oh, I work on something so abstract. Or, are people really going to understand the point? Um, and the answer is yes, they, they definitely can. Um, uh, you just have to, you know, work on the knowledge translation and think about how you want to deliver it um, through mediums such as GradClick or your elevator pitch, or three-minute thesis, or a quick conversation with, you know, somebody at a conference. Yeah. So anybody, again, un un do unmute yourself. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Ask your question verbally. It's a little easier to kind of do a, do a conversation if you're asking a question in person rather than... If I could just jump in. Um, yeah, you know what? No matter... I know that there's a broad range of research that's being done at the university and some is more applied and some is more theoretical and all of it is really equally as important because, you know, research goes in a cycle. The theoretical research informs the applied research. I think the problem is that people understand the significance of applied research much more than theoretical research, but that doesn't mean that you can't communicate the idea. It just means you might need to have a bit more of a creative approach. And I would um, suggest for you to watch, um, there's a 3MT video from Matt Barry that is really good, uh, a winning 3MT video of a non-health related um, uh, research topic. And the way he accomplished that was really quite amazing. So I'd suggest check out that video for more yeah, creative, uh, different sure. ways of um, yeah, showcasing no, non-health related research. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's uh, Matt, Matt Berry's is an outstanding presentation. Um, I noticed that Catherine Mabry is online or has been online. If you want to say a few words of encouragement to the GradFlix. And just adding on to that. So Geneva uh, also said that um, it's not so much that as frivolous, it seems frivolous in comparison, talking about, you know, health related research compared to other um, areas of research. And uh, 
I remember Catherine Mabry telling us that she has her PhD in history, actually. So Catherine, I don't know if you want to maybe say a word about that. Thanks, Megan and John. My uh, internet is a bit unstable today. <laughs> um, but I, I will say that, you know, for everyone who's considering participating, if I can just remind you that this competition is about communicating something about your research story. I mean, you might not be at the end of your research yet, so you don't have a whole finished story to tell. Maybe it's about the question you're asking, the approach that you're taking. Maybe your first expectations met with, you know, spectacular failure. And it's kind of like, well, that was unexpected. Hey, that's a great story. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with telling that story. And in fact, it can be some of the best stories you've ever heard. Um, so, you know, don't look at it as I have to have a story that fits in X box, because really, it's not about fitting into a specific box. It's about sharing your research story and letting us know what's interesting about it or what you find important. Um, with my own research, looking back in hindsight, I actually had um, quite a bit of uh, race and gender involved, even though I was studying the history of medicine. Um, you know, I, it wasn't what I set out to do. It's just where the data and, and information and case studies led me. Um, so it's the kind of thing where it's the unexpected stories sometimes um, that might actually be the thing that you want to share. So, you know, go ahead and, and just see where it takes you. Be creative. You know, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourselves. This is a competition that will help you build skills. Um, but at the end of the day, it is, you know, the world will not stop spinning. Um, and you can try again next year if you decide that you didn't like the way that you built your video or, you know, you learned a lot about the editing process because you've heard here from people where, you know, it was a lot harder or more involved um, than necessarily anticipated. So, you know, learn engage, grow. That's the point of grad flicks. If, if I can get across that one piece, that's what I would want to share. So thank you so much. And, and John and Megan, back over to you. You're doing a tremendous job. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Catherine, for your encouragement. Uh, Catherine Mabry is coordinating this, uh, this uh, event for the School of Graduate Studies. And that was a very, very well uh, presented uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, very well presented set of words on on Gradflix. That's that, that's very important. You don't have to have finished your work. Uh, you know, um, uh, drama involves conflict, setbacks, mountains that are insurmountable. I mean, in terms of Anna Marinka's uh, video, maybe maybe that problem doesn't have a solution. Maybe she ends the story with that little ladder and that in that that wall and that leaves you with a cliffhanger so you could have a cliffhanger situation where the story in fact doesn't come to an end tune in next year to next year's grad flicks where i will tell you part 2 of this year's uh, story i mean anything's possible and be be inventive be creative uh, remember it's not all about communication there's creativity as well whatever that means, and uh, be creative, and don't be afraid. And I see in the chat here that Judy Patterson kindly uh, linked um, the video to Matthew Berry's three-minute thesis that John was just talking about, um, and Matthew went on to win Ontario's competition as well, and uh, Matthew's video, uh, Matthew's three-minute thesis and research project was uh, actually not um, in the medical or biomedical uh, field. So give that a watch. It's an amazing, amazing three-minute thesis. Yeah, I remember when I worked with, with Matt, we talked about stage right and stage left. He's an actor, and I suggested that when he while, while he was playing the scientist, he should be uh, stage right when he's the the, uh, the actor, he should go to stage left to kind of use the space that he had to uh, convey an image depending upon which side of the space he was on. So um, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting video to watch. Um, anyone we else? We still have time. Uh, I can kind of weigh in with a little bit of like, I guess, literary theory that I learned in high school. So... 
there's a very, very clear distinction between what is the story and what is the plot. So the story is the sequence of events as they transpire. That's just everything that's happened, right? Uh, if you are on some grand journey, right, what happened was at some point they sat down and had lunch. Did you see that on screen? No. So that wasn't included in the plot. The plot is everything that is shown to your audience. And so it is up to you to craft a plot out of your story. And that is how you actually portray anything entertaining. Because I can tell a story about, I went downstairs to pick up a coffee. End of story, not very interesting. But now when I start to review more plot points, well, I started walking down the stairs and I encountered a good old friend and he told me about how he failed this test. So I sense I'm consoling him. So I went through this really long process just to get my coffee. And now that becomes more engaging, even though all I did was go down and get coffee. Right. So it really is about crafting plot from your story. Right. And I don't remember this, the saying exactly, but Alfred Hitchcock is famous for saying words to the effect that um, a good story is uh, real life with all the boring bits taken out. And some of the boring bits, maybe having coffee and, and, and lunch uh, or a sandwich, unless there is something dramatic about that uh, event. So you take out all the boring bits and you have your your presentation. And when I say boring bits, boring bits perhaps to your grandmother. And by the way, the word grandmother popped up in the um, uh, showcase, uh, the uh, Waterloo showcase this year, if you want to watch that uh, online, um, the idea of grad flicks or could be three minute thesis being an opportunity to explain your research to your grandmother. Now why grandmother rather than grandfather? And my question that I throw out to all of you, would your grandmother understand your research based on your one minute grad, Vic, grad Flix video? Are you sure that your grandmother would understand every image, every metaphor and not confuse the metaphor with reality? We can always confuse metaphor with reality and someone who's outside the field can easily wonder whether ducks are what your research is all about or um, elastic bands is what Megan is researching or to, to doing research on elastic bands. I mean, somebody could still be confused depending upon their background. Any comments from anyone? Uh, can I just chime in, John, for a second? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's been some uh, some great examples uh, about you know communications and some. So you can clearly see the um, the past participants from McMaster. That's on uh, our GradFlix page. There's a link right there to the playlist. Um, John's indicated watching uh, from Waterloo. And yes, they just actually had their finals for 2022. I'm also going to encourage if uh, if we have anyone here from the social sciences and humanities, take a look at Ryerson uh, because Ryerson had uh, a fairly diverse field of, uh, of grad flixers. Um, yes, theirs are two minutes long, so they had an extra minute. But the idea is if you're looking at how did they tell their story, um, there was a number of different approaches because they had people they had people who were doing documentaries because they were from uh, fine arts. Um, and so you get a completely different perspective if you're trying to say, how might I tell my story and what might work for me? Um, you know, look at diverse videos, right? Don't just look at um, videos that are within your wheelhouse, but go beyond that and then kind of start to, to have that strategy thinking session um, where you can go ahead and script. And, and one other thing they'll add in as well, um, if you are... When you're planning out your session, remember that this year, one of the requirements we have is for everyone to provide us with a transcript of your video. Um, so you can freestyle it, uh, but then you're going to have to transcribe everything that you said and put that into a document. Um, so, um, you know, be thinking about that as you're going forward, because that will end up being tacked on to the amount of time that you have at the end um, to have a completed submission. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. So listen, we should probably draw this to a close unless there are some last minute 
suggestions and uh, uh, audience, uh, if you're in GradFlix, feel free to reach out to me for help. Um, anyone want to offer a final word or shall we just bring this to a close? Megan, would you like to kind of close this off for us? Of course. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, we hope that you've learned something useful. Um, as John mentioned, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to him. Uh, he's an amazing resource, um, gives amazing advice and guidance on telling your story and script writing. Um, even if you send a very early version of your script to John, uh, it, it really helps to get the ball rolling and um, helps you to kind of uh, start thinking about things. And I know that um, registration and video submission isn't for a while, but um, get started as early as you can, if possible. Uh, there are a lot of little intricate things that you may not be expecting that um, can come up, especially with filming and editing and putting together the actual video. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I look forward to seeing your videos in the GradFlix showcase this year. Great. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to our guests as well. Um, really, it was a great session. Great session. Good luck. <laughs>